Hello everyone, this is Daniel. This is going to be part 14 of my new Christian series, and we are continuing our mini-saga with regards to our Christian character uh, portion of the series, and we are going to be discussing, this time, sexual ethics. And, uh, and um, transitioning from what we have uh, been studying for the past two videos, we've been looking at a few different things. We were looking at... Um, separation from the world. We were looking at things that we need to do in order to give us the space in order to grow our character. And from there, then we looked at different aspects about what are the things that uh, God, I believe, wants us for his Christian uh, children, for his children to have in their lives, that they take care of their body. How do they respond to the body? How do they re um, treat the body? And also, how do we operate as Christians in the area of our speech? So we all covered that uh, last time. And now today we are transitioning into uh, a derivative of this section of the body, and that is going to be sexual ethics. Sexual ethics obviously belong underneath the bodily category. And so... The reason why we need to explore this topic of human sexuality and how we as Christians should approach it is because there's great confusion in the body of Christ as to um, what are the things that God expects from us um, on a, on a, I guess you could say it's on a sexual basis. But also, um, we need to understand that um, this is a topic of great importance because culture has uh, twisted the ideas of what this is really about. And it's important for us as Christians to understand what is God's point of view on human sexuality so that we can, um, so that we can see the dangers of what culture has to say on it and that young Christians um, would be also aware of maybe some misconceptions sexually as to what God requires of us in the Bible. So we are going to start off with, um, on a very basic plane, we're going to start looking at sex and its place. What is God's intent and design behind it? And then after that, we're going to look at specific sexual sins that you need to be aware of, that you need to watch out for that you're not committing. So let's begin. Sex and its place. The first thing I want to start off with in this regard is that it is a good thing and it is not something to be disgusted um, with. And um, we're going to start off with um, looking at the very beginning. How did God um, approach this topic? In fact, how did he create you know, this to even being a topic. So we're going to start off in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, and we're going to read God's design for this. So it says this, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So the first few things that I really need to point out here from the beginning is that Eve was made specifically for Adam. And they and she was compatible to him as the helper and as the person that Adam needed. But not only that, but she was also physically compatible to Adam so that they could also reproduce. And we act, and that is what the Bible means by when it says that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. There's some more aspects of this that, uh, that, are in the, that is in the text, but we're not going to look at it uh, right now. The other thing that I want to um, point out is that, uh, well, like I said, this is something that was... Um, Eve was made for Adam, and she was made compatible to Adam physically. And we see, of course, the um, 
the fulfillment of this in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. It says, now Adam knew Eve his wife. That is just an Old Testament uh, euphemism for uh, sex. And she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. So the first thing I want to point out about sex is that we see the purpose of God in it, that from Genesis chapter 2, this is something that is supposed to be between a man and a woman because the man was made for the, because the woman was made for man and they were both brought together and they become one flesh. So on a relationship level, they are to become one and on a sexual level, they are compatible for one another to be able to reproduce. And we actually see this in the in something known as the creation mandate, which is in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So that last part, uh, that last part right there where it says that God um, blessed them and he told them to be fruitful and multiply, that is known as a creation mandate. And so what we see from the Old Testament is that Adam and Eve are told to have sex and to produce more humans um, to, uh, to be on the earth. And the reason why I want to point that out is because it's very clear that one of God's purposes for sex is obviously sexual reproduction. You don't need the Bible to kind of know that. But I thought it'd be very nice to start off from the beginning because there's some more aspects to this that we see in these verses that we've just seen. We've seen from Genesis chapter 2 and even Genesis chapter 1 that, um, that therefore this, you know, this expression of human sexuality to be able to reproduce, um, uh, to, to produce more human beings is something that God designed to be in the context of a marriage, a committed relationship between one man and one woman, a monogamous marriage. That was God's original design. And indeed, uh, Jesus confirms this. He says in Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, he says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from, uh, from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joyed to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce uh, to divorce your uh, his wife. Um, no. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual morality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. And so the point that I want to bring out from this is that Jesus confirms that marriage is something that is supposed to be in a committed relationship of two people. They're not going off and divorcing one another. It's supposed to be between a man and a woman. And so we get a very uh, solid foundation uh, on which to build that marriage is something that is designed between a man and a woman. And marriage is the only place where sex has its proper uh, abode. And so what I want to say is that this obviously immediately rules out homosexuality. And I don't want to go into it um, in depth, but what I do want to say on it is that, is that homosexual temptation is not the sin. Rather, pursuing the act is. Um, two people of the same gender can, in a, in a way, love one another just like Jesus loved his disciples and his disciples loved him back. If you remember, John the Apostle um, reclined at Jesus' bosom at, um, on the, at the Last Supper. But there is absolutely no room at all for sexual expression uh, between two people of the same gender. And so, very simply in the Bible, that is perversion, and the Lord calls it in Leviticus um, an abomination. And again, I just want to reaffirm that having homosexual attractions is not the sin itself, just like having an attraction to sin is not does not mean that you're committing to that sin, 
Um, however, you know, regardless of what our attractions may be, sexually, whatever it might be, um, if they are sinful, we ought not, we should not act on it. Um, so that is what I'll leave it at that. So sex, God's place in it is within a marriage between one man and one woman in a committed relationship. And it is for the purpose of reproduction, but it's not just for the purpose of reproduction, but there's also good reason to believe that it is made as being something that strengthens the relationship between husband and wife. If we look at Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 through 20, it says this, it says, Drink water from your own cistern and running, and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. So what is going on here is that the, the writer of Proverbs, Proverbs is telling the reader to basically don't go out and, and have affairs with people. Re, just, you know, have the portion that God has for you, right? It's a, Very explicitly, it's saying have sex only with the person who you're married with. And then it says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times, and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman, and be embraced in the arms of a, of a seductress? And so I think the point here is, is, uh, is clear. Number one, it's, it's warning us against sexual morality and marital infidelity. But the, the thing that I, that I specifically wanted to point out is that it talks about being satisfied by the wife, you know, via sexual intercourse. And so the conclusion that I come to when I read this is that sex is not just for reproduction, but it's also for a man and a wife to enjoy one another and express their love for one another in a physical manner. Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 5, and he says, Nevertheless, because of sexual morality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her over her um, the wife the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So there's a lot going on there. We're going to bring this verse back up uh, soon. But the point here is, is, is that is that Paul understood that sexual desire is, an, is a natural human desire and he encouraged uh, the man and the wife to come together so that they would fulfill that desire uh, for one another. So that is the other aspect that God has in his design for human sexuality for Christians, that it is for reproduction, but it is also for uh, both the husband and the wife to enjoy it and to, um, and to strengthen the bond, the bond that they have with one another. Now, a good question to ask is, why does God only want sex to be within marriage? Does God just want to be a cosmic killjoy and he wants you to just ruin everyone's fun and take away sex from everyone? Um, not exactly. The reason why there's there's a few reasons why God wants sex to be only in marriage. The first reason that I can think of is that the level of physical contact that is present um, in sexual intercourse is proportionate to the level of commitment that you have to that person. For example, all of us as human beings, we naturally prefer that that strangers keep their distance. We're not comfortable with hugging strangers, but if it's a friend, we would be comfortable with that. Now. When it's a wife or a husband or some someone very very close to us, that is whenever the physical, um, the physical um, intimacy. That's when it increases. When it, incre it increases uh, proportionally to the level of commitment and the level of a relationship that you have with another person. And marriage, as defined from Genesis chapter two is the closest of all human relationships. It says that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The the, the relationship between a father and a mother to their child is a very, very important one. And indeed, it's the first relationship that a human being really has when they enter this world. And that person then leaves that and joins to something greater, their wife or husband. And so, and so if you have a very close relationship, the only place for something like sexual intercourse is in a very close relationship where that sort of physical intimacy would not be um, shameful 
or make you feel uncomfortable. This is why rape is a very destructive, um, a, a very destructive experience for a person to undergo because they feel violated um, in, in a horrible way. That's just not meant to be. They're emotionally damaged, they're spiritually damaged, and in some cases they're even physically uh, damaged and, uh, and harmed as well. And so that is the number one reason because because of the power that sex has with how emotional of an, of an experience it is and how close of an experience it is, it has to be in a place where there is a proper level of relationship and that relationship would between would be between two people who are committed to living uh, for one another sacrificially in the form of a wife and a husband. Secondly, the reason why God wants this in marriage is that sex is a baby-making machine, and I do get quite a lot of laughs whenever I say it that way, but it's true. Marriage provides the grounds for children to be conceived out of the act of procreation, but then be raised in a loving um, and safe environment, being taken care of by two individuals that are committed to one another and that child as well. And the point that I want to bring up is that how much pain do we see with people who grow up without a parent uh, because the child was conceived in sinful circumstances? How many times do we see that a person, uh, that, that two people get together, they create a child and they decide between abortion or not, and if they don't abort, they go and they uh, put the child up for adoption, which is much better than abortion, of course. But then that child grows up essentially feeling rejected. And it doesn't even have to go that far. Even with, even in households where where um, where people grow up with a uh, with a single parent because the other parent decided to leave, because um, because they got what they wanted and they just they're just like okay see ya. There is an incredible amount of pain that goes um, that goes into that on the part of the product of that the person that is conceived and the person that that comes out of that ordeal, and so people are hurt whenever. Whenever a child is not brought up in a loving and safe environment, which is best produced by a man and a woman um, together working for the good of each other and the child that they just created. Um, any other way is, is a way that, that hurts the person that is created in that act. That is another reason why God wants uh, sex to be within marriage. The third way, I've already alluded it to, to it a bit before, but God designed us this way, right? Frank Turk, who's a Christian apologist, speaking on this issue once said that when you have sex with someone, everything changes. And as a single man who's never had such an experience, um, I cannot relate exactly to what Frank is going after here, but I'm willing to trust what he has to say about this. But what I will say is that God designed sex to not just be a physical action. That is what culture has gotten wrong. Sex is not just a physical thing. Sex is very much a spiritual and emotional experience where there is a physical unification of two people, but, is, but it, goes far beyond, uh, it goes far beyond the physical aspect. And so when something is designed to be done one way and it's gone about being done in an incorrect way, we should not be surprised when things go wrong. We should not be surprised whenever, whenever there is you know, shame uh, of, of a lost virginity, we, of, of a lost virginity, we should not be um, surprised whenever there's STDs floating around because of all of this, right? So if God designed us, He's the one who, who designed us to be sexual, and He has special pres prescriptions for human sexuality, and He expects that things would be done in a certain way, not for His own good, but for ours. So let us, let us abide by the by the prescriptions that God gave us. They're not restrictions, they're prescriptions. And those prescriptions are for our own good. So let me just recap that first entire part because next we're going to specific sexual sins. Uh, first of all, sex in its place. God designed it to be in the context of a monogamous uh, marriage between a man and a woman that are committed to one another for a lifetime not just you just come together and you just divorce because you feel like it that's not what it's about um it sex is for the purpose of reproduction but also for strengthening the marriage between the man and the woman and the reason why god wants it within marriage is because first of all um the level of physical commitment um that goes into that act needs to be on uh, proportionate to the 
level of, um, of relationship that you have with the person. Number two, it's a baby making machine and children should be brought up in an environment that loves, uh, for, that loves them and cares for them. And God designed us this way and he knows, uh, and he knows what is best for us. And this is true because if you look up online, you'll find that studies show that Christian couples are actually more sexually satisfied than non-Christian couples. So if God gave us these prescriptions and they work well from an empirical point of view, then God knows what he's doing. But anyway, let's move on. So now that we understand what God's purpose for sex is, now I want to go into the specific sexual sins that we as Christians must be aware of and avoid, and if we're involved with them, overcome them. The first one is adultery. I'm starting with, with some of the most major uh, sexual sins that are, I would say, normal ones. I'm not going to talk about bestiality and things like that. But, with, but in normal circumstances, adultery or marital infidelity is one of the biggest ones. And the Bible is just very clear on this. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. That comes from the Ten Commandments. In Leviticus chapter 20, through 10, uh, chapter 20 and uh, verse 10, we see God's um, attitude towards it. He says, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So God is not playing games around with adultery. Now, this verse, we do not use it to say, well, we should start killing people who are adulterers because this was in this this was part of the um of the governing law of Israel and that has since passed but the point here is is that God hates adultery and he doesn't want us to do it and one reason why I mean I don't even know if I have to give a reason but this is one of the greatest ways that a person can betray another person you have such a close and intimate connection with another people and you've and you've had you know and you've then ha have had sex and you've experienced that closeness with that other person and then that person goes off and, and they do it with someone else who they're not committed to they said you were, they were committed to you but then they're going off and they're doing their own thing and so that is one of that 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 hurt that a person feels that is one of the greatest ways that one person can betray another person that the trust and the closeness that was in the relationship was betrayed so that's why adultery is something that is completely off, off off limits for us as Christians. Um, secondly, fornication. Fornication is the Bible's way of saying sex before marriage. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, we get this warning. It says, Marriage is, um, is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So it's very clear here that, that both for adulterers and fornicators, God will judge. God never designed sex to be um, outside of marriage. It's only to be with the person that you're committed to. And God will judge that if you do not follow his prescriptions on it. Um, again, sex before marriage is bad, and God wants sexual intimacy to be within marriage. And the question that may be asked here is, well, what if I'm planning to get married? Is, is it okay for me to have sex with my fiance or someone that I'm planning to marry? And uh, planning to marry, and I, and I just have to say that that question is irrelevant because it has nothing to do with anything. Should I take something from the store and start, you know, start, you know, walking out with it, but then the person catches me and I say, well, I was planning to pay for it. Um, that, of course, is, is, is not really a good, a good excuse. Now, the person may say, well, well, that's different. That's different. It's not like what this is about. But even still, it doesn't matter because sex is only within the context of marriage. It is only in the context of marriage. There's no prescription from the Bible anywhere for it to be, for it being outside of marriage. Until the wedding vows are made, until the wedding vows are made, that is, it's, it, it there's no room for it because what God is looking for, for is primarily the commitment first and then that's allowed, allowed. But until the vows are made, there is no grounds for that. Um, and, here's, and here's another thing. You don't know if the person that you're planning to marry is the person that you will actually marry. There have been instances in the past where people were thinking that they were going to get married to someone, but it didn't happen. And so you simply do not know until it actually happens. But regardless, I don't even have to go into that because, again, until you say the wedding vows and until it's been made official be before the community, you have no grounds for it. Biblic uh, you have no grounds for it biblically. And that is the thing that we must follow by. 
And again, fornicators, God will judge. So whether you like it or not, just, just wait until those vows are exchanged and then you can have, and then you, you are able to have that. The next sin that I want to talk about is pornography. And this is a very, uh, well, fornication was a big one, but pornography, I think, is an even bigger one, especially because of how accessible it has become today. But what I want to say about this is that pornography is essentially spiritual adultery. And another thing that you're doing is that you are finding pleasure out of other people without actually caring for them or making a commitment to them. And so you start essentially using other people as just a piece of meat for your own uh, viewing pleasure. And you just simply don't care about the other person. And so that is, that's bad. It's, it, it's like I said, it's spiritual adultery. It has no place in, in a Christian's life. And so I suggest wholeheartedly that you need to cut this out if you're involved with it, because this will do a, this will damage you in a couple of ways. And I'm going to list those things. Um, well, right off the bat, pornography will destroy your perception of what sexual intimacy is actually like in reality. Think of when you go to the movie theater. Let's say you're gonna you're about to watch a Marvel movie. Um, when you watch that movie. When you view all the all the superheroes and, and and all the things that is happening in the in the film, do you actually expect that to happen in real life? Um, I highly doubt it. And the reason why is because you know what reality is, and you know that that is not how things are. But what if you took someone who has never really seen the outside world, and you've put them in a movie theater, and then they and then you started and then they started watching that? They might be tempted to think, "Wow, this is what reality really looks like," because they look at that movie and it looks real and all that different stuff. And this is my point, that porn is nothing more than a fiction, and as a result, it's like that Marvel movie, it's a fiction. All it does is it creates a scene, and and then it makes you think that, oh, that was, that's what it must be like in, in, in reality, but that's not at all the case. And so what this does is that this then begins to overblow your expectations for the real thing when you come face to face with it. And again, another thing that pornography does is it gives you a mindset of starting to treat other people as nothing more than a piece of meat or something to be used for your pleasure rather than being a human being to be loved. And this is so true. I've experienced this myself that whenever you cut this stuff out, you then begin to be, you then are able to start looking at people of the opposite sex and you're actually able to look at them as a person and not as something to be um, to be used. And this is the right way to go because it will also increase your intimacy in the marriage bed. The the, the other the another another thing that is uh, horrible about what pornography does with regards to introducing the fictions that it propagates is that um, it gives you uh, sinful sex ideas. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, there's something very interesting that I want to point out. But it says this. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the, 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 uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And so what I want to point out here is that the, at least the New King James Version makes a distinction between homosexuality and sodomy. It says, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Now, if those two things meant the same thing, then the Bible here would have been redundant. And so I decided to study this and see, well, why does it use these, these two words that seemingly are the same thing? Do they mean different things? And indeed, these two words do mean different things. Homosexuality is about the nature of the sexual relationship in the sense that it is same-sex oriented. It's, it's more so concerned with, with, with the object, not the subject. It's more, it's more concerned with what is the sex being done with rather than how. And sodomy actually addresses the how. Sodomy, um, if you look up the definition of it, it refers to specific sexual acts which are done in homosexual relationships, but they can also be done even in straight relationships. And I'm going to have to be explicit here, so prepare yourself. But sodomite sexual practices include oral sex and also anal sex. And I just want to be very upfront about this, that God did not do design those body parts for sexual intercourse. And we have medically documented 
the ill effects of such practices. And I want to really point this straight out for you as a Christian because, and it's not just about these sodomite practices, anything else that pornography may introduce into your mind where it starts to really uh, make you tr try and, and treat someone in, in the bed in a very carnal and selfish and horrible way, you know, get rid of that. You shouldn't even be watch you should not be watching pornography whatsoever. There's absolutely no room for that in a Christian's life. And so that's what I have to say about it. And again, going back to, to the sodomite sexual practices, this is something that e that uh, Christians themselves have, have have asked questions about. They're unsure. Well, is it is it okay in a straight relationship? Is it not? I mean, it, it is my wife and I'm and I am faithful to her. But I would make the argument that I think the Bible explicitly here pro prohibits it, in that this is a sodomite sexual practice, and God, and just by how we are designed sexually, we can really easily come to the conclusion that our body parts were never ever designed to be used in that way. And when you use your body parts or you use your your spouse's body parts in that way, then you are dishonoring them, and you are defiling them in a spiritual way as well. So stay away from these practices. Do it the normal way, the natural way, the way that God designed it to be done. The last thing about pornography is that it makes you desire sexual morality and it, quote, wakes up love unnecessarily. And that wakes up love phrase that I just used comes from out of, uh, comes out of Song of Solomon, chapter eight, verse four. It says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up or, or, uh, nor awaken love until it pleases. And very simply, the Song of Solomon is a book that is talking about human sexual love. And the point that I want to bring across here is that in God's word, it tells us not to stir up love or sexual desire before it is the proper time because you're going to suffer. And that is what pornography does. It stirs up that desire in you. And then it makes it, of course, difficult to deal with with the desires that you've aroused, and now you're trying to hold them down, but at the same time, you're being tempted to, to act out upon them. So this is why you should stay away from all sexual stimuli until you're married, so that you're not awakening sexual desire within yourself until the proper time, because if you do so, you're then going to start to suffer a lot, especially if you're, well, you're going to suffer a lot if you want to be faithful to Christ. But Christ already said we're going to suffer for him, so just get on with it. Get rid of the pornography. Um, the next sin we're going to be talking about is masturbation, and um, this is a one that has become uh, a little bit more controversial. Uh, this one has become controversial. I think with pornography, there is there is absolutely no question as to its sinfulness. But with masturbation, this is where, again, there there's there's uh, questions on this. But let's address it. So what is it? Well, the way that I define it is that masturbation is any intentional stimulation done for the purpose of sexual pleasure. And my viewpoint on it is that it is sinful. Because if you look at the scriptures, God has designed all sexual acts, uh, has designed and designated all sexual acts to happen in the marriage bed. Again, we've seen this from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, where it says that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. This automatically suggests that sexual practice is to be in the marriage bed. But what about those who are doing it outside the marriage bed? But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So those who are engaging in sexual acts outside of marriage, those are the people that God will judge. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2-9, through 9, which is the verse I said that we would bring up uh, before, it makes it even clear here. It says, Nevertheless, because of sexual morality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourself yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The first thing I want to point out here is that, is that Paul does not say go and masturbate so that you, so that you don't give in to your lack of self-control. Okay? Moving on. He's, he continues saying, But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, which is that Paul was single. He, he desired that all men could be single like him so they could work for the Lord. But then Paul says this. He says, But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the end, unmarried and the widows, and listen closely, 
it is good for them to remain even as I am, which is single. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them masturbate. Oh, wait, I, re I read that wrong. It says, let them marry. For it is, mar it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 like this, that Paul makes no provision for masturbation. All sexual acts are to be in the marriage bed. All sexual acts are to be within the context of a marriage. And if you can't exercise self-control, go get married. That was Paul's um, solution to the problem, not masturbation. Marriage, not masturbation, that is the solution. And if you can't get married, then you must exercise self-control or learn how to. Even still, I think it's best for you to learn how to exercise self-control before you get into marriage because then you might start committing adultery. But um, therefore, because of all this, masturbation is excluded as being a sexual practice um, outside of marriage. Now, what about within marriage? Um, I believe that even there, there are some very big questions about it because Derek Prince and other deliverance ministers um, whenever they were, whenever they were casting out demons out of people, they have encountered demons of masturbation, demons of oral sex, and 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 stuff like that. I've read this in in Derek Prince's book, "They Shall Expel Demons." And so the point that I would make here is that I would I would say that it's a sin, and the reason why is because again, God did not design sex to be something to be done with the hand, but He made the woman for the man in that capacity. So I would I would say that if you want to be careful here and you don't and you don't want to have any grounds for for God to accuse you of being uh, sinful in this respect, then just stay away from it. Just do it the way that it's always been uh, been done naturally. And um, again, I would say that it's a sin. I, I I think it is a sin. But you have to come to that conclusion. Ask the Holy Spirit and consider the things that have been said here. Now, masturbation is the most common sexual sin out there, and so I've made a series to help people on overcoming it. It will be in the link in the description. It will be victory over sin. So you have that at your uh, disposal. The last sexual sin we're going to talk about is lust, and this is the common denominator um, in all of these sexual sins that, I, that were just listed. So if you notice, I was a bit clever here, and I kind of started with the most uh, significant sins and went down with them. So it's like so it's like this: lust leads to masturbation, then masturbation leads to pornography, then pornographation goes to fornication and adultery. Right? Um, one cascades into the other, and that's why we we start from the top down. Though I wanted to start from the top down, though, so that I could get to the root. And the root at the end of it all is lust. This is the common denominator. Whether you're adulterating, fornicating, masturbating, watching pornography, lust is the common denominator in all of them. And what I want you to notice is that this seemingly small little thing, Jesus equates to adultery. Let's read. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28, it says, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus is not pulling punches here. He, he, he takes lust, which is seemingly the smallest sexual sin that you could commit, and he equates it to, to the largest one that you could commit. One of the largest ones, at least. In a normal sense, of course. I'm not covering uh, extremes like bestiality and things like that. Um, but what we understand from this is that at the end of the day, lust... Is something that comes from the heart, right? He says, he says, to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart um, or in his mind. So this is a heart issue now. Lust is not a physical act. It's really a state of the heart and the way that you are perceiving reality around you. Although I will say that lust is an act in the sense that you can commit to lusting. Um, and this thing is the root of all any and all sexual impurity, this impure heart. And so we must focus on this as a heart issue. But what is lust? What is it? Well, very simply, you know, there have been a lot of definitions of lust, but the way that I define lust is that lust is very simply the desire for sinful sexual pleasures. It means desire, it's, it means heavily desiring fornication. It means desiring adultery. It means desiring masturbation. And I mean this in a very heavy sense. If this is like a temptation that you're trying to resist, that is not it. What I'm talking about is that is that you have this this drive and thirst for it and and you are acting out on it. 
And one way that can be acted out on uh, that you can act out on this is through fantasizing about it. So you may think about someone that you know, and you may imagine you know fornicating with them. Essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're in, you know instead of watching pornography on a screen, you're not having pornography in your brain and in your mind, and that is sinful. That is lust right there. That is an unclean mind, and it's and, it, and, this, and it's really no different than pornography at this point. And so what I want you to and I want and what I want um, to say about this is that there's a couple of distinctions that have to be made with lust. I want you to, again, please note that this is different from a temptation to do these things if you're resisting it. But if you are consciously and willfully bringing up these things, like you're like walking along and you're like, hey, it'd be wonderful to think about fornication and you just start you know, creating a scenario in your mind, then that's lust and that is fantasy and you should not be doing it. Um, Lust is also a, an impure sexual desire that you have towards something. So it's like if you start desiring, you know, a young woman that you should not be because she's not your wife, then you're like, nope, I got to stop that. I'm going I'm going a different direction. But if you continue to desire and desire and just build that sexual excitement within you, you're lusting. And that is a sin. And in Jesus' eyes, it's as if you're committing adultery. Um. This is something that needs to be put to death in us. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, in the ESV version, it says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion. Passion is the way that I would say is, is uh, another way that the Bible describes lust. Because you're like passionate, you're, 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 you're aroused, and you want to go do sexual things, uh, impure sexual things. Moving on, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. So these are things that Paul tells us in Colossians to put to death. Get rid of these things. Get rid of adultery. Get rid of fornicating. You will be judged for those things. Get rid of pornography. Get rid of masturbation. Get rid of lust. Put those things to death. Another thing about lust is that this does not encompass a natural desire for sexual intimacy with a person. God gave us sexual desires. He gave us a desire for this. But what we must do is we must keep it under lock and key until the time that God has for us. And I'm going to end this message with an encouragement to you. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses um, 1 through 8, um, it's not the last verse of the message, but one of the last. It says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, uh, or lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And so what I want to encourage you with this is this. Don't be discouraged. There will be a proper time, as it says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, even sexual intimacy. And so even if God calls you to, year of, to years of purity, don't be discouraged about it because God has laid out your life and there is a time for every matter under heaven, a time for everything. There is time for everything. So just be patient, allow God to bring it to pass, and you will enjoy that blessing with no sorrows. And you will be able to receive what God has for you, sexual intimacy, in all of its fullness. Because you are listening to God, you're following his prescriptions on the matter. Another thing I'll encourage you with is that in the, in the description, I will have a, a resource on, on marriage, since that is the, the gateway to getting this. I'll be attaching Derek Prince's God is a matchmaker for your uh for your edification <clears throat> and so the conclusion to this entire message is stay away from sexual immorality and keep your body pure in 1 thessalonians chapter 4 verses 3 through 8 it says for this is the will of god your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality and that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So, the conclusion is clear. Let us stay sexually pure, 
let us get rid of those sexual impurities that are in our lives and let us walk in holiness to the Lord. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, and I hope that you will, uh, f that you have found this edifying and also uh, a good resource for you. So anyway, be blessed in Jesus' name, and I will see you in the next message.